What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of the Fit Women's Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Kendall, and on this episode, we're going to be talking about intermittent fasting because this is something that you hear about all the time for years. For the past couple of years, intermittent fasting has been something that's been brought up of should you exercise on a fasted stomach or should you practice intermittent fasting to help with body fat, to help with stress. There's all different reasons why you hear you should intermittent fast, and there's so many reasons why you should not intermittent fast. And new research has come out with surprisingly negative benefits of fasting that kind of makes you go, whoa, wasn't expecting that. So we're gonna cover that. But before we get into it, I want to be 100% transparent with you guys. I've practiced intermittent fasting off and on for years. In fact, my typical regimen was that I'd have my first big meal around 11 to 12 each day. And I did this for years, probably starting around 2017, because at the time, intermittent fasting was become really mainstream in the fitness world, thinking that it would provide you with more mental clarity, it would provide you with more focus throughout the day, with more energy, and to help get rid of some stubborn body fat as well. So I figured, what the heck, I'd try it. So at first it was intentional, but then it actually became a little bit less intentional simply because my schedule at that time was pretty chaotic. I would leave my house at 5 a.m., but I wasn't getting home until about 8 p.m. during that time. And so we weren't eating dinner around till like 8.39. So for me to wake up at 5 a.m., I just wasn't hungry yet at that time. So I just wasn't thinking about food and it naturally just became part of my program, my daily habit of things. And I would get home at around 11 a.m. and that's just when I would eat. And then in 2022, I started incorporating small meals back into my personal morning routine. And I couldn't say that it made a huge difference. It was more of just, I had a little bit earlier dinner at night and I know the importance of fueling, especially for good cardio workouts. So I would really force myself to eat a little bit of something. But to be honest, I never really noticed any big difference between my energy and the workouts that I actually did. However, I did gain a couple of pounds over the past few years. I'm sure part of it is hormonal, part of it is a little bit of lifestyle change, and part of it is stress. <laughs> so then in actual 2024, this year, just a couple of months ago, actually about a month ago, I started implementing intermittent fasting again, just to experiment with some things. And right now I feel great. I start my day with just some coffee, and then I don't eat until about 1130 each each day. So I'm coming from this And going into this report going, huh, what do I need to know? What new research has come out that maybe will change the way that I personally look at intermittent fasting? And anytime I learn new information, I want to bring it to you guys. So we're going to learn this together. I guess before I really start, it becomes the question of, do I recommend intermittent fasting for everyone? And absolutely not. But... We're going to hold off on my exact answer on this and go through the article first, and then I'll give my opinion at the end based off my own personal experience and, of course, what the data shows. Because at the heart of it all, let's see what data shows, let's see what the science has to say about it, and then as a personal trainer, not as a medical professional, not as a doctor, I'll kind of break down, should you do it, should you not do it, the benefits, and obviously maybe the negatives. However, before we jump into the article and we talk more about intermittent fasting, there is something that I need you to do. Are you subscribed right now to the Fit Women's Weekly Podcast? There's a really good chance that you're not, you guys, because most listeners and most viewers, if you're watching this on YouTube, are not actually subscribed. However, by subscribing, just hitting a button, it literally takes point five seconds can make a really big difference in helping get this podcast out to other people because the more subscribers that we get, the platform says, huh, people are tuning in. They're listening to this. Let's make it easier for other people to find this. And so it comes up on more search engines a little bit easier and in the search bar of the actual podcast platform that you're listening to it. So please do me a favor, make it real. Let's make it podcast official where instead of just listening in each week and kind of seeing it on your listen regularly stuff, let's make a commitment. 
hit that subscribe button and let's make this a real relationship. <laughs> and I will thank you forever. Okay, so now let's get into this. As we've been doing in the previous weeks, I will read some of the article and then we'll talk about it. We'll break it apart a little bit. I'll share um, the good parts of the article and some of the parts that make me go, huh, I don't quite know about this. And before we actually go into the article, I should say that this article is called New Intermittent Fasting Studies Had Surprisingly Negative Effects, and it was published on TMJ4 news channel, but I have seen a version of this article in so many different news outlets that is why I thought that it was really important to talk about this. Well, let's go. Well, I don't know. We're only going to go if you subscribed. <laughs> okay. Intermittent fasting has been a, a popular way for people to lose weight and trim body fat, but new research has surprising results that prompted concern from researchers. So just a little bit about actual intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting was made popular by Dr. Jason Fing. This is me talking, by the way, y'all. So intermittent fasting was made popular by Dr. Jason Fing, who presents a lot of data that shows it's not just about calories that makes a person gain weight, right? We are always thinking that everybody has this set metabolic rate, and if you overeat it, then you're going to gain weight. If you undereat your calories, you will lose weight. And of course, there is some truth to that, but in Dr. Fang's book, I've actually read most of it, I'm over half of the way through, The Obesity Code, he talks more about how it's hormones, your hunger hormones like leptin, ghrelin, and insulin that really affect how somebody holds weight and loses weight. And the ability to be able to control those hormones through fasting and through staying away from processed carbs and most carbs in general is what he talks about in this book. This book can be a whole nother podcast. I just kind of want to highlight a little bit about the idea of intermittent fasting. Um, he highlights it a lot in the obesity code. So if you are somebody that likes to learn a lot about research, likes to see data, then definitely check this book out. It's taking a little bit longer to read simply because I read this <laughs> at night before I go to bed and I'm exhausted. So I only get through a few pages at a time, but it is filled with a lot of information that just kind of makes you go, huh, this is really interesting. And it also makes you wonder how much of the data that we have and how much stuff is pushed to us is simply for economic gain versus actual scientific research. But again, this could be a topic for a whole nother podcast. If you're interested in that, let me know. But I wanted to bring this to the table because I feel like intermittent fasting, the idea of it is something that we think has been around forever and ever, where Dr. Jason Fang, obviously the name Jason to me is a more newer name anyways. It's not that old a book. This wasn't written in like, the 1920s. This is a doctor who is out now today, and he's the one that really brought intermittent fasting to the light, quote unquote, the father of intermittent fasting. All right, so let's continue on. Research presented Monday indicated that those who only ate for eight hour window every day had a 91% higher risk of cardiovascular death compared to those who ate meals throughout the day or within a six to tw uh, 12 to 16 hour window. So first off, make a little note of that, that the ones that they studied was an eight hour eating window. And the research was presented at the American Heart Association's Epidemiology and Prevention of Lifestyle and Cardiometabolic Scientific uh, Sessions in 2024. Given that the increased body fat had been linked to a higher risk of cardiovascular death, the study's lead author noted his shock by the results. We were surprised to find that people who followed an eight hour time restricted eating schedule were more likely to die from cardiovascular disease, even though this type of diet has been popular due to its potential short term benefits. Our research clearly shows that compared with a typical eating time range of 12 to 16 hours per day, a shorter eating duration was not associated with living longer, says senior study author Victor Wentz Zong. So, what I find really uh, interesting with this is that there have been studies done that shows 
that eating a low calorie diet has been associated with living a longer life for a lot of people. And really at the heart of it, intermittent fasting, like most other diets, are simply a way to decrease your calories. It's not necessarily supposed to do that. Anytime you're studying intermittent fasting and people are trying to do it, whether it is to lose weight or for that mental clarity or that buzz and energy, it's the idea that even if you're eating in a smaller window, let's say you're only eating for eight hours per day versus that 12 to 16, that you're supposed to still eat the same amount of food, right? So it just means that you're supposed to eat bigger meals. But obviously when you're eating bigger meals, you kind of start just to feel like blah, and it's hard to do. So you end up restricting your calories indirectly so you would think that if you're restricting your calories, you're naturally eating a lower calorie diet than you were before, then perhaps that would lead to a higher or a longer lifespan because of the low cal diets in the past. So yeah, just kind of a little bit of food for thought on that. Um, and I guess they're pulling that 12 to 16 window out because if you're sleeping for eight hours a day, um, then yeah, so 24 hours minus Eight is what 16 hours so there you go the study included 20,000 adults in the US with an average age of 49 years and it followed them for a median length of eight years so good little amount of time to actually do some research on each individual Previ previous research has suggested that time restricted eating can help lead to weight loss and according to the analysis from researchers at the University of Chicago intermittent fasting was just as effective as calorie counting for weight loss so is it because intermittent fasting is a way of cutting calories this is me talking is it because intermittent fasting is a way of cutting calories that it's a lot harder to eat the same amount of food that you would in 14 hours if you only have six to eight hours like we just talked about or is there something else to it like dr fung suggests such as insulin control so is it the calories that are making people lose weight during intermittent fasting or is it controlling the hunger hormones, having more control of your blood sugar, eating less processed foods. What is the actual um, this to then, right? Is it, what's the way I'm trying to explain this? What's the purpose behind the weight loss? What is the actual mechanism behind all of this? The average person who ate meals between noon and 8 p.m lost almost 11 pounds, 10.6. So also, I wanna know the health of the average person that was at the start of this. So for example, were these individuals overweight? It really doesn't talk about it much in this particular article, but, and I think I may, might make some notes of this later on, that yes, I had to go back and I, re like I said, there were several publications talking about this study. And once I dug a little bit deeper, the individuals that were participating in it were, considered overweight or obese at the end of, or at the beginning of the study. The reason that I asked this and I wanted to know more about it was because if the average person lost almost 11 pounds, then that's kind of a significant amount of weight, right? Or at least for some people. So it would make me think that those people had excess body weight to lose. Whereas somebody will just say for myself who isn't considered overweight, it's a lot harder for me to lose weight and I don't have 11 pounds to lose. So it just kind of like makes you want to know what was the average start of people health wise in order for them to be able to lose the weight that they did. Um, so if they, their pre intermittent fasting health could lead to cardiovascular issues in the future, right? What was their health going into it? And were they doing anything else? So it could not, I'm trying to make sure that I, I say my words correctly, <laughs> right? So I want to know what other factors they were looking at in this study. If the subjects were overweight and the only thing that they changed was they included intermittent fasting into their life, did they make any other lifestyle choices if they were considered overweight and if they were obese? Did they also increase their cardiovascular exercise? Did they 
add in any strength training exercise? Did they add any other improvements in their life versus just the intermittent fasting? Because then if you're looking at this study and then looking at the normal population and you see that 91% of them had cardiovascular health issues at the end, where well, you're like, okay, but you were looking at a study of 20,000 overweight people right? Who may not have been making, I'm not, this is not a blanket statement. This is just saying maybe a lot of these people weren't living a healthy fit life to begin with. So is it true that X equals Y? You just need to do a little bit more research, right? We need to make sure when you're doing any kind of this, we don't want to just blindly say it's because of the intermittent fasting that put their self at risk of cardiovascular disease. They were also doing X, Y, and Z um, that could also have lead to those issues. So something to keep in, keep in mind. Restricting daily eating time to a short period, such as eight hours uh, per day, has gained popularity in recent years as a way to lose weight and improve heart health, says Zong. However, the long-term health effects of time-restricting eating, including risk of death from any cause of cardiovascular disease, are unknown. And, you know, I've just got to say 91% risk of cardiovascular disease is a huge percentage. That means that only 8% of those participants that, 8%, 9, hello, math, 9% uh, of the participants didn't have cardiovascular disease by the end. That's crazy to me. This is what makes the study so hard to control is that we don't know precisely what each person was eating too. And I, I've said this before when I've talked about other diet, diet studies is that it's not as if you can put someone in a completely controlled environment where you can put a human into a laboratory for eight years to study them, right? You don't understand everything that's going on in their life. You don't know every single thing that they're putting into their food. Unfortunately, we know that anytime people are set to write down their food for something like this kind of study, they're not always 100%. And that might be intentional sometimes. It might not be intentional sometimes. They might forget. They might kind of bosh some numbers. And that's just human nature. So it's really, really hard to know what that person was eating. Um, during that time? Are they eating more processed foods in the eight hours that they're able to eat? Or are they saying, okay, because I'm only eating two meals, I'm going to make sure that those two meals are crazy. What was their mindset going into it? What were their healthy habits? What was their ideas on eating real food? And are they already at higher risk of cardiovascular disease prior to going into it? Are they working out like I already talked about? So I always get really excited by these studies, but then I get a little bit disappointed because I feel like there's such big claims being made, but not a lot of information yet. And I know that uh, the participants in the study, I know that the scientists that are doing the study plan on digging a little bit deeper to be able to find those answers. But I wish that and before just kind of fear mongering, mongering, <laughs> Fear mongering, because I know a ton of people are definitely into intermittent fasting, that they just gave the idea of like, this is what raised our eyebrows, but we don't know the answers yet, right? Versus people going, oh my God, if I intermittent fast, this article says that I'm going to die of cardiovascular disease before I should. <laughs> so, ugh. Right. And, and I know that at the end of the day, news outlets are just trying to get people to read and intermittent fasting is a really big topic. But I just, again, wish that we were able to dive a little bit deeper, get more research out of it so that we could really give complete answers before people just say, oh, my gosh, this is a good thing or oh, my gosh, this is a bad thing. So overall, going back to the article, this uh, overall, this study suggests that time-restricted eating may have short-term benefits, like the weight loss, but long-term adverse effects. So would it be okay, this is me, would it be okay if you were to intermittent fast for a limited amount of time just to basically gain a better understanding of hunger cues and then go back to three balanced meals, or should intermittent fasting be avoided altogether? just more things that this research needs to kind of dig through. And hopefully these are the questions that come up to the researchers when they're looking over things as well. And when the study is presented in its entirely, it'll be interesting and helpful to learn more about the details of the analysis, said Christopher Gardner, professor of medicine at Stanford University. 
The University of Chicago says, and this was a different study, that the following groups should consider not intermittent fasting. Those who are pregnant or lactating, absolutely agree. Children under 12, I think that most children, no matter the age, should not practice intermittent fasting. Those with a history of disordered eating, absolutely, because obviously it is just a way to restrict even more. Those with a body mass index or BMI of less than 18.5, sure. Shift workers, studies have shown that they may struggle with fasting regiments because of the shift work schedule. And I think we should do a whole podcast on shift workers. I actually would love to have someone who is a shift worker on this podcast to talk about their own personal habits and how they navigate that because my heart goes out to shift workers. I don't know how you guys do it. You don't get to follow a circadian rhythm. Your eating habits are off. It's just, that's crazy to me. Shift workers are on a whole nother level. (laughs) I want to give you guys a high five if you're a shift worker. And those who need to take medication with foods at regimented time, obviously. So that's the actual end of the article. I want to break it a little bit down some more. And I also have a couple of other little ideas. First off, the question becomes, should you try intermittent fasting? At the heart of it, that is up to you. Maybe, maybe not. You should absolutely talk to your doctor first to see what they have to say about it. But I do agree with the list of the article that we just covered about who should not be practicing intermittent fasting. And I also want to add one more, and that's people who do early morning workouts. I get asked all the time of, should I eat before a morning workout? If you are new to working out or you're new to becoming a morning workout person, then yes, you should fuel your body before you work out. You're at a high risk for bonking um, for or what's called running out of fuel. Your body uses up all of the glycogen and you get very dizzy. You can get sick. And it's a really crappy feeling and you're not going to be able to get everything out of your workout. So do you burn more body fat in a fasted state when it comes to cardio? You burn more of a percentage of body fat, but studies also show that you don't have as much energy in those workouts. So you'd actually still burn more quote unquote body fat if you have a little bit of fuel in your system because total calories are more because you're able to give yourself more. So it all balances out to show that yes, you should work out with some food in your system. And I have seen so many clients when I trained people one-on-one that would come and be like, I'm just not hungry in the morning. And then they'd have to stop halfway through their workouts because they were dizzy, they were nauseous. I had to pop their feet up several times and it's just not worth it. So even if you're having to just down a few bites of banana, every little bit can help, but don't go into it being like, oh, I heard that fasted cardio is better. So that's what I'm going to go for. No fueled cardio is better. Cardio that you can actually complete the entire workout is going to be better for you. Now, going back to the study, how do I look at this? I think that a lot of research needs to come out on this. I do find it very, very interesting. And I absolutely do think that that's something that we need to consider in the future being like, okay, maybe fasted, uh, habits, intermittent fasting is not the best way. And for most of us, it is not going to be beneficial. It is just another way of cutting calories, regimenting our diet and making things more complicated than it needs to be. At the heart of it, we need to just teach our bodies a healthy system for fueling ourselves. You should be able to listen to your hunger cues when you're hungry, eat and eat enough to fill you up to your next meal right? For some people, that might mean waking up on a Saturday and not being hungry till 10 or 11. And that's okay too. But don't do it simply because you're trying to necessarily intermittent fast. What I do think should be done a little bit more in this study is this showed an eight hour window, right? So it was 16 hours of not eating and eight hours of eating. But there are so many different types of of intermittent fasting. You can do intermittent fasting where you do um, a 72 hour fast. I would never do that. I would actually never recommend doing that, but they do exist. There are 24 hour fast. There's a five to two diet. It's a modified version that you alternate a day of fasting that involves five feast days and two fast days per week. I wouldn't do that either. Again, 
Just saying that from a scientific perspective and doing a study on intermittent fasting, I think that these methods might want to be analyzed as well so that you can get a really great idea. Um, and then there is alternate day fasting, which typically involves a feast day alternated with a fast day where you eat 500 calories on your fast days, which is kind of interesting because it's a fast day, but you're actually able to eat. So it's more of just a really low calorie day. And then there's time restricted eating where um, you can eat for four to 10 hours and then no eating for the rest of the time. The other thing that I want to talk about is when it comes to women's health, because that's what we focus on most of the time here on Fit Women's Weekly, is women's hormones are different, right? Our sex hormones are different. Our hunger hormones are a little bit different than men in the way that we process it because of estrogen. And so a lot of research has shown that women should not be fasting for over 14 hours at a time because it can throw us out of whack a little bit and actually be more harmful for us than good. It can affect our cycle, especially if we are in the premenopausal era of our life. So that is, again, something else to take in consideration. And I never fast for over. I stop eating at around 8 to 8.30, and then I uh, start eating again, like I said, at around 11.30. So however many hours is that? That's right at about 14 hours. I try not to go longer than that. But just, again, something else to take into consideration. And I've talked about fasting from the woman's perspective and for hormone health in previous episodes before. So if you want to learn more about that, let me know and I can link it up. But I wanted to break this article down a little bit more, put out another idea. And basically at the end of the day, here's what I say. If you are looking for intermittent fasting as the miracle way to lose weight, then I'm gonna let you in on a secret. There is no miracle way to lose weight. It does come down to tracking your nutrition, making sure that you're fueling your body with the appropriate amounts of protein, carbs, and fats necessary for you, and cutting your calories to go down into a deficit. Intermittent fasting is not going to be the all be cure, right? The miracle cure to try to lose those last 5, 10 pounds, or if you have something more like ambitious that you're trying to work for, you're going to be much better off creating a healthier habit of eating throughout the day and tracking your food. However, if you are just somebody who's really curious about it because you know other people that have experimented with intermittent fasting, you have heard that it could help you burn a little bit of extra body fat, then as long as you're healthy and you've talked to your doctor, always have to put that disclaimer in there, then I'm always an advocate for experimenting with your body. That's why I do it. Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, most of the stuff like this, you are not going to develop any bad health habits within a week, a two weeks, a month, right? If you want to experiment with things like this, whether it is intermittent fasting, all of a sudden you want to experiment and you want to try keto. Do I think keto is great? No. Do I think the carnivore diet is great? No. Do I think that being a vegan is great? No. But you know what? I have personally been intrigued by all of these ways of eating and of living a lifestyle. So I've experimented with them all just so that I can see what it actually feels like so that I can have talks about it and I can understand the way that the body moves. If at any point, which has happened, I say, this isn't for me, I'm not locked into it. Right, And I can say, this is what I learned. This is the way that I felt. This is why it worked or why it didn't work for me. And then you get to go right back to your previous habits. Or you can take what you enjoyed. You can definitely take elements of each thing to help create the best lifestyle with your nutrition that is absolutely possible. There's been elements of the vegan life that I was a vegan for two years that I still adopt. There are some elements from doing carnivore for over five months that I still try to apply to my nutrition nowadays. But I don't look at it as, oh, I'm trying carnivore. I'm stuck in carnivore for a year. If at any time you're experimenting with something, whether it's carnivore or intermittent fasting, and you go, okay, I got enough out of this. I did it long enough to say that I tried it. I don't love it. And then you go right back on. Your body's not going to change overnight. You're not going to change overnight. And if at any point you're just not satisfied with it, go back. 
right? I just always want to, I feel like there's this fear mongering in especially the fitness realm where people are like, you can't do this. But at the end of it, it is your body and you can experiment. And what works for one person might not work for you. And what works for you may not work for that person. But if it's something that you're interested in, experiment with it and see how it works. If it doesn't work, no biggie. Go back to your previous lifestyle. And if it does, awesome, right? So there's your food for thought. I would love to hear your thoughts on this and intermittent fasting. If you've ever experimented with it yourself, I would love to hear how it went, how long did you do it, and what was your fasting window? Like I said, this one was 16 hours of no food, eight hours of an eating window, but and my personal is 12 to 14 hours of no food, and then whatever the rest of that, 12 to 10 hours of food, <laughs> okay? But there, I would love to know if you've ever done like a 72 hour fast, what is that like? I am never gonna try, I am not curious enough to ever try that, I'm not gonna lie. I have done a 24 hour pa- uh, fast years and years and years ago, and that's fine, but because I am so active with my lifestyle, a lot of times when you're doing those longer one to two to three day fast, you're recommended to not exercise, obviously, because your body needs energy to be able to do those movements. And I don't have that freedom and flexibility to not work out since that is part of my life with Fit Women this weekly. I never want to say, sorry, guys, we're not going to have our workouts this week because I've decided to not eat, especially coming from my background. I don't want to ever restrict myself to that extreme. Um, Just going back from where I was in my 20s, just not something that's interested to me. But if you've done it and it worked for you, let me know. All right, guys, that's today's episode. Yeah, that was a good one. If you found this interesting, please let me know. Make sure to subscribe. You can slide into my DMs, Kindle Boyle Fitness over on Instagram if you have questions or topics that you would like covered on this show. If you would just love to connect with me, I would love to do that. You can email me, Kindle at fitwomensweekly.com. I will be back on Friday for a new episode because Saturday is my 40th birthday. It has been a roller coaster of emotions as we roll into 40. But for the most part, I think I'm pretty excited about it. Um, I'll share more of my thoughts on actual Friday and the biggest lesson lessons that I've learned in my 40 years. In the past, I've always done birthday podcasts where it's like 39 lessons I've learned in 39 years. I'm not going to do that because I feel like it's become very repetitive, obviously, from doing it year after year. But I am going to share some of just the biggest life lessons that I've learned in becoming 40. And also what makes, why is it such a mental F? Right? Well, why is it hard, so hard on me mentally to accept 40? And why has it caused so many like tears, but also the excitement with it? I don't know. It's going to be a very big yin and yang. And then the final thing that I will share with you guys is I did an interval workout. You guys know last week I talked about, well, if you didn't listen to last week's episode, you might not know. So go listen to last week's episode too. But I have implemented on Tuesdays doing um, interval speed work in a way to help me get back into a little speedier runs. So if you're tired, if you're a runner like me, or you get out there and you're just trying to run because you're trying to increase your cardio, if you're tired of never getting faster, (laughs) which has been me for the past couple of years because I haven't worked on that, you're not gonna get faster simply by saying, I wanna get faster. If you're out there running, just the same pace and you're doing these long runs time after time again, you're gonna maintain that same pace over and over. You're never gonna get any faster. So one way in order to get faster is to start making your legs work and start turning them over, your feet, your legs, moving faster. And I'm doing that with speed intervals. So last week I did a one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one speed interval ladder. Today I did a two minute speed run followed by a one minute recovery walk for 19 rounds. So for two minutes, I ran my little heart out as fast as I could focus. I made myself run faster than I would if I were just out for a normal um, steady state run. So those two minutes, I really pushed it. And then that one minute recovery run was there. And then I would do that again. And I went back and forth for 
19 rounds. It ended up being um, right at, I think, about 52 minutes of interval work. So that's definitely on the long side. But that's also because I have already built up that much cardiovascular strength. And I'm not saying that you should be doing 19 rounds, but maybe start off with just 10 rounds of two minutes hard, one minute rest. And then you're just teaching your legs to move faster. And then that fast pace will work its way over into your steady state runs too. So before you know it, you actually will start to run a little bit faster. And finally, because this girl's been running the same pace now for like three years, <laughs> um, if not actually have even decreased my speeds over the past couple of years. And I'm excited just to get back at it. I'm starting 40 y'all being the fittest and the healthiest that I can possibly be. And that means hitting new goals and pushing myself. I'm not gonna start stop pushing myself just because I'm a, into a new decade. It's not gonna happen. I've had people ask me before, legitimate people in my life, family members ask, how long are you gonna keep doing this? And the answer is until I can't do it anymore. And I'm doing this so that I can continue to live a life and never settle because, oh, I'm 40, I should slow down. I will slow down when my body tells me to slow down, but right now it's telling me I can do the things that I can do and I'm not giving up. So don't give up. Hopefully that helps. All right, you guys, go have a great day. Mwah. Thanks for hanging out. Hit the like, hit the subscribe. Bye.